Hello. Today I'd like to take a look at a topic and I would address this as a question really. Is calling someone mentally ill a hate crime? I think a good place to start on this question would be to go to a government website www.fbi.gov where they say at the top of the page on hate crimes an official website of the United States government. So I'd like to read for just a minute what they happen to say they call a hate crime. They say under defining a hate crime that a hate crime is a traditional offense like murder, arson, or vandalism with an added element of bias. And then they say, for the purposes of collecting statistics, the FBI has defined a hate crime as a criminal offense against a person or property motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias against a race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. So, with that in mind, I guess I would ask again the question uh, as, as food for thought, perhaps. Is calling someone mentally ill a hate crime? Well, I suppose then the next question would be, what are we even talking about by mentally ill? And for that, I would bring up something that might surprise some people. And that would be to go back 2,000 years ago to the Christian's Bible, and in particular, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, I'm not a preacher, and I'm not even saying something one way or the other about religion or any particular one, but I find the following passage very illuminating as to what Jesus or whoever spoke these words thought most important and least important about human beings and happiness. So to quote a few verses from New International Version of 1 Corinthians 13, it says the following, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So, end of the sermon. <laughs> Again, I'm not preaching one way or the other for Christianity or any religion in particular. But just to reiterate, I wanted to bring up a perspective that I think our modern society and certain countries in particular have lost sight of as to what's most important. And then of course, what we might call a dysfunction or even a mental illness, so to speak. Now, I would maintain personally that the U.S. approach to psychiatry and so-called mental health has almost everything to do with how a person feels and how they function with regard to surviving, especially in the modern day and age, such that, for instance, issues like anxiety are highly um, an issue when it comes to diagnosing someone as mentally ill. Or additionally, anything that prevents them from putting food on the table, so to speak, for themselves and their family or getting and keeping a job, uh, let's say 
alcoholism or they're ending up then in prison for uh, doing this or that, that can uh, generate a whole slew of mental illness diagnoses too. Same with homelessness in general, such that the homeless, so to speak, are termed mentally ill very often. There being a strong correlation drawn in certain circles in this country. But then, what about this little thing? What about violence? And in particular, what about violence done with the pen, so to speak, not a fist fight? What about crimes committed, not with your hands, such as burglary, but crimes done legally, such as slavery in the past? Or what about crimes done to the poor in our country by certain people not paying a fair share of their taxes, but this being legally uh, enabled? What about crimes done to people in foreign countries when our country might say that we're simply protecting our way of life and what we do considered quite legal? Well, these things do not fall at all under any kind of rubric of mental illness in the um, U.S. psychiatric system. One of the reasons I maintain is because there's no diagnosis of sociopathy, only antipersonal personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, which in my mind applies mostly to those with little impulse control who may get in fist fights or uh, become inebriated. But other than that, there's no diagnosis for many other issues. And so, there seem to be plenty of diagnoses for anxiety-related conditions, but not violence-related conditions. And hence, too, also diagnoses for those who can't put food on the table or can't study well in college because they have anxiety issues. But this all goes in contradistinction, then, to what the Bible said is most important, which is love. The Bible did not, for instance, talk anything about whether someone with a great deal of empathy has an anxiety issue, or whether they may have a delusion, let's say. Indeed, some people would say everybody has a delusion, and it's just a matter of who is in uh, a position of authority to declare who's got a delusion and who doesn't. Um, a case example, I don't know how many think of it or not, but especially in the Soviet Union of the 1970s. It was rather routine to declare that Christians were mentally ill and then say, well, that was because they were delusional. You could say, for instance, that a Christian is delusional on the basis of thinking that Jesus rose from the dead when there may not have been ironclad proof in a test tube of today but then, who is to say who has a delusion and who doesn't? Who is to say, in fact, we're not delusional for thinking we're awake right now, when a year from now we might wake up suddenly and say, by golly, I was in a dream state for 50 years and I just woke up. So who is to say who's delusional and who isn't, first of all? We can't be sure any of us have delusions that we don't know of, in fact. And yet, the Christians were routinely sent to psychiatric hospitals and drugged until such time that they basically lost, lost awareness of their thinking as well as the capacity to feel anger and thus protect themselves. I would maintain that some of this goes on today with um, what we might call the mentally ill in our country in particular that 
certain people, perhaps some of the most loving, in fact, the most compassionate and empathetic, could easily get the label of mental illness. Well, much more egregious persons, much more aggressive and violent, get off scot-free. I would also suggest for consideration that it is the people who are most kind, most empathetic, most responsible, who take stock of their lives and say that struggles in life aren't their, all their own fault, or all others' fault, rather. That there's some component in themselves that have caused their emotional suffering. And so they'd like to seek help, any kind of help. Spiritual help from a pastor or from someone who studied in college and is called a psychologist or psychiatrist. But what typically happens is that the moment they enter an office of a psychiatrist, they will leave with a armload of prescriptions for drugs and a um, mental illness diagnosis of some sort. Now this might not be so bad except for one thing. What about all the people who don't go to a psychiatrist's office for assistance of some sort in personal growth? Because they say in their minds that they're perfect already, so why go? Or perhaps they're a little wiser and know beforehand that they would come out with a diagnosis and a clutch full of prescriptions to fill and uh, much stigma afterward. You might say they're more clever, more savvy as to the way the world really operates, so they wouldn't dare go to see a psychiatrist. Instead, they would simply stock up the liquor cabinet and um, medicate themselves in that way, in a um, non-stigmatizing way, or go buy a joint, or shoot up heroin, anything but something you have to get from a psychiatrist. Now, to move on to the topic of hate crimes, I would bring up the following, that, in my mind, a hate crime is something of a scapegoating situation. And in past days, there were many use, words used against various persons of various colors, for instance, or various nationalities to scapegoat them. In other words, for someone to say that they're not going to take responsibility for how they feel and simply blame uh, their pain and suffering emotionally on someone else. So you would find terms used in the past such as, and please excuse me if these are a bit tension causing to some, words like WAP for certain Italians, or kike for Jews, or wetback for Mexicans, even to the extent of saying that they caught diseases while swimming across the Rio Grande, or Injun for Indians, or retard for anyone with less than average IQ. And, of course, for many generations, the N-word, I hesitate even to speak it, in fact, toward blacks. Or, too, consider that at some point in time certain groups of people have said that certain nationalities are genetically inferior even, such as those in Nazi Germany declaring that the Jews were genetically inferior. Or, the same has been pointed out by some toward blacks. And finally, even modern-day psychiatry sometimes saying that the epidemic of drinking and alcoholism thus amongst the Native American Indians of America is largely genetic.
Again, a slur, if you will, pointing that these people are inferior because of genetics. You might say then that all these people are declared mentally ill in some fashion. They're inferior by way of genetics, it's being say, said. Now, if a person were to look back in history, you would see that a lot of these labels, a lot of the scapegoating has become unpolitically correct, if you will, especially thankfully due to various movements, some very courageous people through the times having uh, put their foot down, so to speak, and changed things around. But mankind, being what it is, always wants a scapegoat if they can find one. So what better scapegoat then for the modern era than to declare someone mentally ill? It being so hard, for instance, to disprove it. So, I would maintain that it's an interesting question to ask whether today's favorite scapegoat isn't the N-word, but the M-word, as in mentally ill. If you look back, for instance, there have been some famous people throughout history, and I can cite some from my own personal life, too who have what you might be call been deep-sixed by a diagnosis of schizophrenia, say, which in my mind is a very questionable diagnosis for the simple fact that this term refers to someone having either a delusion or confused thinking. But who of us does not have some misconception that we hold on to very dearly that in psychiatric parlance would be called a delusion. And who of us under stress does not feel confused? Both of these then possible criteria used against a person to call them mentally ill by way of schizophrenia. Well, take for example something someone probably doesn't know. Cary Grant, the actor of in the past, on the silver screen, regarded as one of the greatest actors ever, had a mother whose father, or whose husband rather, had her declared mentally ill and locked up for over 20 years. This is not, of course, an incident that's isolated. How many wives, for instance, have been either hit by their husbands or demeaned and turned into house slaves and then become demoralized and when they might seek help or be forced to seek help that um, they get called mentally ill with the diagnosis at a very minimum of depression. I would maintain the diagnosis ought best to be called being bummed out or despondent or hopeless under certain circumstances like that, especially under um, circumstances where the Christian Bible says to be submissive to your husband, or maybe your faith says you should never get a divorce no matter what. I would also mention from personal experience something very gut-wrenching someone very close to me for many years had been diagnosed with a certain quote serious mental disorder and they were told they had bipolar disorder in other words fluctuations in mood it was said and perhaps rapid speech it only came out to me late in the relationship that this person had suffered ongoing weekly sexual trauma from her stepfather. But then, to add insult to injury, she was never diagnosed as having trauma, PTSD if you will, but only bipolar disorder. 
and then given quote medications for this to help calm her mind. But here's the even greater injustice, perhaps, that I knew her stepfather. And at one point in time, one day, he told me, How can you live with someone so mentally ill? Now, he had probably never step, stepped foot in a psychiatrist's office. I would humorously say maybe because he couldn't find a suitcase large enough to carry all the prescriptions that the doctor might write him as he exited the room after an interview. And of course you know he would be deathly afraid to hear what someone might say about himself and his behaviors. So the point being, he walked off scot-free and told me that his daughter was severely mentally ill, but he was fit as a fiddle, basically. Now, how many other times has this happened? How many people get called mentally ill by people who are the antithesis of health in terms of what I brought up in the Christian scriptures of health essentially being whether you can love or not. That if you can't love and feel empathy and compassion, you're a clanging symbol. Or in today's language, I would say you're the one who's greatly mentally ill. Not the people who are able to love and have empathy and get squashed on and maybe have anxiety problems. And finally, from personal observation, I would hypothesize that perhaps many people get forced into, quote, seeing help if pressured by someone violent or sexually abusive or emotionally demeaning and abusive too. And that this tends to happen when the person who used to submit and not put up a fight starts to get a clue, if you will, what's going on and typically may start to assert themselves or show signs of calling in the police even, at which time the oppressive element, if you will, wises up real quick and says, I better do something about this before it blows up in my face. And the next thing you know, the suffering person gets a diagnosis of mental illness after being encouraged, if you will, to seek help. And, of course, once they get the diagnosis of mental illness, I would refer to this as sort of a deep-sixing effect, where they're quickly medicated with drugs that both dull their ability to think further of whatever happened to them and how to protect themselves in the future and even prosecute, if you will, in a court of law but that additionally these drugs tend to stymie aggression or rather anger that could be useful to provide courage in the fight. And so if you strip a person of their ability to feel anger, they will on this accord too become mute as to what happened to them. Not only will their memory be rather blanked out, their awareness because they can't really think under the conditions of being so heavily tranquilized with what they call medications, but their anger level, too, will be stymied. They can't pursue any kind of justice if they don't feel courageous enough to because they don't have an anger component as a defense mechanism. You might say, then, that this can be sort of a uh, competition here between the person who is starting to wise up 
and who might call in the police or file charges in a court of law versus the oppressor, the abuser, who sees this situation about to blow up in their face and says to themselves, I better do something about this. I better have them declared mentally ill, for instance. I probably can't kill them, but I can have them declared mentally ill and drugged up and stigmatized. And of course, anyone receiving a diagnosis of schizophrenia and then drugged is not going to be a very credible witness, are they? Not in today's realm, anyway. Any charges someone on disability, for instance, and termed mentally ill, any charges they might file against an oppressor or an abuser would likely be laughed at under the charge that any charges made are ludicrous because you don't have your marbles, your you're schizophrenic, you're mentally ill, you don't know what's going on around you. And we have it in black and white in the government records that say you're disabled. So at any rate, I would um, suggest to any listeners that perhaps we all ought to consider whether there's any basis at all or more than a 5% basis, say, for claiming someone has a, quote, mental illness on the basis, first of all, of anxiety or even confused thinking or, quote, mood fluctuations or delusions. If, in fact, we all suffer some of this, especially under pressure, first of all. And who's to say who has a, quote, fixed belief and who doesn't that you might call a delusion or not? And who's to say there's a genetic basis for this or that too? When in fact you could also say there could be a genetic basis for high levels of aggression where there is no diagnosis for such I would maintain. But there are diagnoses for anxiety disorders etc. or even overeating used to combat anxiety, or drug use, or gambling, again used to combat anxiety. Until such time that we can conclude definitively that s troubles with anxiety, first of all, are in fact genetically oriented to a great degree, and not due to abuse or oppression or simply the chaos of modern living, especially in urban areas, and the instability of jobs and the influence of globalization and so on, I think it's kind of a stretch. Especially to consider this final fact, again, that who is to say it's mental illness, to have issues of anxiety, or confused thinking, or periods of despair that you'd call depression, alternated with attempts again to approach life constructively. Who's to say this is a mental illness but aggression isn't? I bring this up as food for thought once again. In a world where, in my opinion, the modern term so used to put down certain people and what you might want to consider a hate crime even is now the word mental illness because all the other words have been declared politically incorrect to use or hate crimes. This is perhaps one of the few terms yet to hit the hate crime list in the FBI's paperwork, and perhaps it should be entered as such in the future at some point in time. I wish you a good day.